Market failures. Sometimes markets do really well, but since the invention of capitalism, we've known the markets have well-known failures. In this video, we'll list the main types of market failures and more importantly, discuss why it matters and why this creates a role for the government in any society that wants to be more efficient, effective, and have free market capitalism provide the most benefits possible. So how should we think about government's role in society? This is an important question since many of us have a shorthand, knee-jerk way of responding to the word government, but it's not necessarily in alignment with what economists believe. A popular view, which is by the way considered a fringe view amongst economists, is one of Ronald Reagan's famous quotes. The nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. This paints the government as unhelpful at best and downright evil at worst, that somehow the government is getting in the way of opportunity, success, efficiency, and freedom. And if you've ever read Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged, you will get a very good feel for this argument. So what are some more helpful ways to think about the government for the purposes of the questions this class is trying to solve? Well, there's lots and lots and lots. And in this presumably Banksy piece of art, you have the idea of the surveillance state. And certainly there are some important questions to be asked about how our government watches and listens to us. One of the more important functions of government for a relatively free market society like ours is the role of referee. When Adam Smith first described how a large free market system could work, he described the increasing specialization of his famous pin factory, where no one person knew how to do all of the tasks in making pins. But that's exactly where the gains were. If we specialize in small tasks, we get really good and fast at those small tasks, and the output of society grows much more quickly. But in a specialized society, we all depend on each other for goods and services that we no longer make for ourselves. And that means dealing with strangers all day long, which, let's face it, just doesn't happen very well or very much without somebody creating and enforcing rules to prevent theft, murder, etc. Going with the soccer theme, we could also see the government as an investor. Almost half of all research and development spending in the U.S. is done by the government through universities and other direct and indirect monies. Without the government investment in infrastructure like roads and freeways and communication lines, there would be much less trade and our economy would be much poorer. Further, if the government did not hugely subsidize education, there would be a lot fewer of us educated, which has many, many bad economic effects. More controversially, the government can pick and choose industries that it wants to succeed and give them extra help. Sometimes this is protecting essential industries from moving out of the country, like, for instance, our famously secret national stockpile of chickens that we need for egg production, which goes into vaccinations. For obvious reasons, we'd like to keep the production of eggs at least partly inside the US. Of course, this does not mean that all governments and policymakers are somehow better and more angelic than the rest of us. They are many times corrupt and self-interested just like the rest of us. For the 2022 World Cup in soccer, which was awarded to Qatar, it was found later that $880 million was paid secretly from Qatar to FIFA, or the Federation Internationale de Football Association, the global body governing professional football or soccer. U.S. Congress people routinely take money from lobbyists to represent business interests in return for campaign dollars we all know it. So the question before us is, should we, for their faults, dissolve FIFA and Congress? Or are they, although flawed, necessary? A point that should be made here is that in as much as government and FIFA officials look after their own self-interest, sometimes at the cost of other people's interest, it is thought that the rest of us humble humans also face that choice daily. So the government is flawed, and the market is only as good as humans, and so the market will also be flawed. Let's look at an overview of the different types of market failure now. First and foremost, what is market failure? Market failure is best described as simply this. 
when markets fail to provide what society wants. This could be markets failing to provide any interstate roadways because there's no one firm that could make money doing it, or markets failing to provide the good but just too much or too little of it. This is the problem with pollution. Now there are ways to measure the what we call socially optimal amount and price of a good by looking at the supply and demand when we count up all the benefits and costs of different types of production. And so we can measure whether the market is providing the socially optimal amount or not. And plenty of times it's not. This is where the government can step in and improve the efficiency of this failed market. There are certain goods that are simply impossible for markets and firms to provide. National defense, national parks, these are examples of goods for which it's impossible to generate enough revenue to cover the cost of providing the goods. Although we all want some amount of national defense, unless the government stepped in and provided it and forced everyone to pay, it would be very easy to imagine the case where although we all want to be defended, many of us would choose not to pay, or in other words, to free ride off others that were paying. If there is a way to escape paying for something but still enjoying the benefit of it, some people will do that. This is the case with an army that's hired to protect the borders. That army protects everyone inside whether or not they choose to pay for it. This is why armies are always provided by the government instead of the market. Another category of market failures involves information asymmetries. This just means that one side, either the buyers or the sellers, has more information than the other side. If I'm selling a used car and I know that there are some serious flaws in the engine or the axles and I can hide that, I might be able to get a much higher price for my car. And this yields a lot of people not trusting used cars and being very wary of them and all sorts of games are played back and forth between buyer and seller and in general, not as many people buy or sell used cars as a result. That's a market failure. If we had perfect information on both sides, there would be a lot more trade. So there have been some solutions developed to this market failure, Carfax, warranties, etc. But it remains, the market doesn't do a good job on, of it, on its own. An even bigger and more important example of this kind of market failure is the failed market in health insurance. This is why it's still a very hotly debated topic in the US. When markets ignore some costs or benefits, the outcome is another failed market. We don't expect the socially optimal amount of pollution to ever be zero, because that would mean no production. But we know that in many cities and places, it's much higher than people would want. In other words, it's a market failure. People would be willing to pay a little bit more for electricity or plastic to reduce pollution and live in a nicer place, and yet that doesn't happen. Without government intervention, climate change, massive pollution problems are a normal outcome of so-called free markets. And the last category of market failure involves imbalances in market power. When Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, he outlined the conditions under which the power of markets through the invisible hand would guide self-interest into serving the common good. So he advocated for the government to have a light touch in choosing what is produced and consumed, but the second requirement that Smith puts down is that there must be robust competition on both the supply and demand side of any market. If you have powerful corporations ruling over many industries and those in management have far more power than your average worker, the outcome is a failed market. Higher prices, lower wages, worse quality, rising inequality, and generally more sluggish economic growth. So how should we think about the government? Hopefully a little bit more nuanced than most of our politicians would lead us to believe. From the standpoint of economists, we need to see the government as the referee, investor, and guidance for the games of the market to be played safely and robustly.